What's up everybody and welcome back to another computing related video. So the laptop itself was £3.50 I think, or £3, I can't remember the exact figure, I think it was £3. In the first half of the bag there is a rather nice uh, original compact ball mouse, it's well worn, um, it's not worth anything, I'll just put that out of the way. And there's the Fujitsu uh, power supply and it's been PAT tested in 2001 and 2. PAT is portable appliance test. It's a, a standardised electrical appliance test that all UK office equipment has to be tested for on an annual basis if it has to go through an office environment and, and be used in an office environment. In the second half of the laptop bag is the laptop itself. Now it's not a Toshiba laptop, it's just in a Toshiba laptop case. The laptop itself is this lovely bluish colour and I don't know if the camera is picking it up, I'll bring you a little bit closer shortly but it's uh, it's got a little crack on here and I think what's happened is that it's been inside the case using these velcro straps really tight and then it's been dropped and the the straps have just put a bit of pressure on on the top of the casing here uh, and, and, and bent the plastic in. I've used some super glue to glue it back together so uh, when I get it out of the case which I'll do right now I will uh, bring it closer and let you take a look. As you can see uh, I've used a bit of super glue to um, put the three main pieces of the cracked plastic back together. There's a hole here I couldn't find that little piece for and even if I did I doubt I would have been able to have glued it back in successfully and there's some chips here missing but there's still a fracture, it's still bent a little bit, but it's a darn sight better than what it was. All the little bits of plastic were inside the case. There's some other damage here on the case. Um, this is at, this bottom half of it, as you'll see in a minute, is actually a, a docking base, um, like a, a port extender style thing. And the idea is it, it slides in down this way before it folds back down onto the dock and so it's just a little bit loose. On the front there is a, a power button I think that's the or that's the dock release button you press that maybe to tell the Windows environment that you're going to disconnect it from the dock. There's a CD-ROM drive, a floppy drive go around the back down the side, it's a little bit dark, I do apologise, let me try and refocus a little bit. That's a speaker grill. That's a fan vent. This is catch is the docking release mechanism. There's another one round the other side. A, a Kensington lock port on the back. We've got a uh, that's the power video out, parallel port, serial, PS2 mouse, keyboard, some USB 1.0 and I think that's another kind of security tag, uh, lock mechanism. Infrared is on the laptop itself, that's the window. There's two PCMSA slots, one is on the other side of the laptop and uh, that's got a 36, uh, sorry, a 33.6 kilobytes modem. I don't have the little dongle adapter, but it's not like I'm going to use it. There's a volume control wheel here, um, headphone out and line in jack, and the other speaker, this will be the right speaker, and as I mentioned before, that's the other dock release. So if we take the laptop off of the dock, There is no actual, apart from the internal hard drive, 
no drives of its own. So it's for its day an ultra portable, ultra thin laptop. It's raised slightly from the table because there's a extended battery. This port here is the docking bay connector port. The model number is a Lifebook 656TX. I think it dates from around 1997 and it's got a design for Windows 95 sticker on it. The dock itself is called a LAN enhancement unit probably based on the fact that it's got a built-in Ethernet port and when you go into System Device Manager it shows up as an Intel Ethernet controller. I have used this laptop um, before I started recording this video and I'm not going to spoil any surprises for you but the second battery seems to hold a charge. How good of a charge I don't know but this morning when I left it on charge overnight both batteries were showing as completely full but now the first battery is showing as empty whilst only the second battery is showing as full. So let's go and plug it in and so we're running totally off of Wall's main power and then we can boot it up with, without fear of it suddenly turning off and damaging any components. It's showing us charging now. I think the CMOS battery is dead because every time I've turned it on it's complained that the CMOS settings are reset and the date is returned to 1988 and exactly as is now and when the CMOS settings reset it also loses the auto detectedness of the hard drive but in this instance it seems to have actually detected them so let's go into setup anyway and just double check so yes it has detected this time the hard drive and CD-ROM drive so it should boot first time it booted it up it would only boot into safe mode until I shut it down gracefully and then it did boot up normally it's booting Windows 98 uh, it is second edition the monitor's got this lovely sliding brightness control it doesn't seem to affect the brightness an awful deal I don't know if that's a battery saving feature or not I believe it's uh, an Intel Pentium MMX uh, a 150 megahertz there's 48 megabytes of RAM installed we will go and check out the full roster of hardware once it's set up and running there is the original owner's name on the start menu and some of his personal documents and it also attempts to sign into MSN Messenger using his email address so before it boots up fully which does take a few minutes I'm going to stop recording just blank out his name and stop it signing in and then we will uh, resume without disclosing any personal information that may still be contained on this computer but the sound, the stereo sound is working. Whilst we're just waiting for it to restart after I renamed the user account and the registered owner names, I thought I'd just give you a quick look at the 33.6 modem. The little port on the side there is where the telephone jack dongle would attach to, but uh, having this present I think slows the boot up down a little bit so I'm uh, just taking it out for now we're back in after the user account was renamed it's now LBX and I've also renamed the registered owner as it would display in system properties there you go LBX and as you can see it's Windows 98 second edition it's genuine Intel it doesn't show the processor's speed what I think it is 150 megahertz as you would see on the post screen and there's the 48 megabytes of RAM so what software is installed on this machine well not a lot to be honest there's Age of Empires that's installed but I think I need the install media to actually get that to run the plays off, plays off the disk there's Windows Media Player uh, Adobe 
Reader 5.1, Internet Explorer 6, and Word 97. I'm not going to run that because it's got the guy's name on there, which I need to reinstall to replace. But it, it works. What am I going to do with it? Well, on this floppy disk, there is the universal USB driver from Phil's computer lab. I downloaded this and on this USB key is Firefox 2.0 and I'm going to get this online and see if I can browse the internet on it as if it's 1999. Let's see what I can do. So a big shout out there to Phil's Computer Lab for providing this on his website. It saves me searching for it. I used to have a copy of, my, of this myself that someone created. I think they lifted it from the Windows ME drivers because Windows ME came with native USB support. It wasn't this exact installer, but this will do. And then uh, after a reboot, I can plug this in and we should be able to get USB support working for these flash drives. I'll come back when this is installed. So we're back up after the reboot and you might be thinking, well, how are you gonna get it on the internet? Well, I'm not going to run an ethernet cable all the way to the router. I've got this handy little TP-Link USB powered wireless dongle. And basically you plug an ethernet cable into this port, the ethernet port on the dongle. And this is pre-configured to connect to my wireless network at home. It's USB powered. So this is connected now to my wireless internet. All I need to do is plug the ethernet port from the bottom of the dock into this. And we should have a connection from the laptop. Right, I'll go and check the network settings and then we'll get to installing Firefox. And I forgot to go through the hardware roster, so we'll do that shortly. So it seems to be working. Um, it's got an IP address on my local network and I can successfully ping Google. So the USB device is in. Next, 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 next. There we go. Store and go. USB device. We should see removable disk. There we go. And in here is the Firefox set up. So I'll come back when this is installed. Next. 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 Finish. Next. Next. Okay. Okay. Yes. Welcome to Firefox on Windows 98. Firefox 2. Point zero, point zero, twenty. So my YouTube channel doesn't want to load very well on Firefox 2, which is not surprising. I don't think the web is usable in such an old version of a browser, but you can do basic searches. The CD-ROM drive is a TIAC CD316E. The hard disk drive is a 6GB Toshiba MK6014MAP. That VBTM store and go is the 1GB USB drive I plugged in earlier. The display adapter is a Neomagic Magic Graph 128ZV. The primary hard disk controller is an Intel chipset 82371AB, and that's the same chipset that's going to control the USB as well the onboard ethernet well i say on board it's part of the docking base is the intel 21143 10 100 sound is provided by an es1878 chip and you've seen the universal serial bus controller not much to say about it really so it's definitely a 150 pentium mmx chip in there with 48 megabytes of RAM. Thanks for watching. Please like and share this video and subscribe for future videos. 
follow me on Twitter at LBX Computers and join me on Retro Machines Group on Facebook. Thanks for watching and see you next time.